Hello. I happened to see part of a documentary on TV about self-driving cars. I don't do a lot of technology stuff, so I thought that might be, a, might be interesting. Now, stories about these self-driving cars appear in the news every now and then, but usually because one has been involved in an accident and either killed or nearly killed somebody. So I've not really paid much attention to the idea that they will soon be a regular sight on the roads. Um, in fact, by 2021, many manufacturers predict they'll have self-driving cars ready to buy. So this seems like a topic I should consider, not least because as my main mode of transport is a very nice looking bicycle, will self-driving cars make my journeys to and from work safer? Particularly from the usual idiots driving Audis and BMWs. And will these cars make the journeys, particularly of those who continue to commute by car, very often short distances, will it make those journeys uh, quicker and less stressful than they already are? Well, let's find out. First, I'll look at some features of newer models of car and relate that to the development of self-driving cars. Then I'll run through the different levels of autonomy with which self-driving cars are classified and finally look through a few of the problems that may exist because of self-driving cars. Hopefully by the end you'll be as surprised as I was when I watched this uh, TV documentary. <coughs> a typical new car nowadays has a number of driver aids to make it easier uh, to drive and safer. I'll explain a few of them. Firstly, lane departure warning systems are becoming more common. These are signals that alert the driver if he or she is moving into another lane of a motorway or highway, a common occurrence if the driver isn't concentrating or is fiddling with something in the car. Secondly, parking assist on cars is uh, one which is often seen on adverts for new cars nowadays. Uh, the car will reverse itself into a parking space at the side of a road between two parked cars, commonly known as parallel parking. Uh, useful, of course, for all of the parents who insist on driving their kids less than five minutes to school and parking no further than 10 metres from the school gates. Hmm. The uh, third one is blind spot warning. In any car there is a blind spot where, if you're looking in the car mirrors, you won't see another car on your left or right um, because of this blind spot in the mirrors. Before changing lanes on a, on a motorway or pulling into the road from being parked at the side of the road, or indeed opening your door, you should physically turn your head to look behind you, to look into the blind spot that the mirror doesn't see. Now these blind spot warnings let the driver know if a vehicle is in its blind spot. I've noticed these on my bike actually, kind of worrying. If they know you're there they may deliberately hit you in the case of Audi drivers. Only joking. Um, <clears throat> lastly is a collision warning and prevention. A common cause of minor accidents is expecting the car in front of you to continue moving forwards at junctions. But they do not. They stop and the car behind uh, runs into the back of them, usually at low speeds at junctions. A collision warning and prevention system will break for the driver of the car. Genius! Now those are typical of new cars nowadays and are almost standard in executive cars like Jaguars and Mercedes. The first two of these, lane departure and blind spot warning aids, are classed as level one automation. In all cases the driver is still expected to do the work, the technology is there to assist, to warn you. The, um, the last one there, the collision and um, the collision warning and prevention is actually level 2 automation which is also known as partial automation. 
This is where the car does a little more than warn you. It actually does something. In this case, it applies the brakes so that you don't crash into the back of another car. Other examples of level two automation are adaptive cruise control, where the car will scan the road ahead and either accelerate or brake according to the road conditions and the amount of traffic ahead. And lane centering, so the car will correct any drifts around the lane and position itself in the centre of the driving lane. At level two, um, the driver could, in theory, remove both hands from the wheel and their feet from the pedals. However, the driver must be ready to take control. So at level two, although the car is doing much of the work, the driver can't sit there reading a book or checking their, their mobile phone, except for Audi drivers, who think that they have better than human reaction times and can do many things at once besides drive. Level three is where things start to get interesting. The official description is that cars can manage the dynamic driving tasks. It is at this point where the car kind of thinks for itself and makes decisions based on what its various sensors and its cameras can see. Now in this case the driver could read a book or do whatever on his or her smartphone because the car is monitoring the driving and the environment. However, the car may request that the, that the driver intervenes and takes back control of the car. So you, as the driver, could not sit in the passenger seat and fall asleep. Now cars like this, this level three car, are regularly tested on the streets of the cities where they are being developed. And it is uh, this type of car that while being tested is the subject of the media outcry when they crash. Uh, for example, in May 2016, a Tesla car driving itself didn't see a huge white trailer attached to a lorry in front of it and tried to drive through the trailer. The driver died um, and this happened because the sensors on the car didn't see the truck because the weather, uh, the sunlight was so bright on a, on a spring day. So that's level three. Level four, as you'd expect, is the next step up. It is effectively fully autonomous, within reason. These vehicles are designed to perform all the safety critical driving functions and they monitor the roadway conditions for an entire journey. However, I did say within reason. This is because the car has a maximum operating zone, uh, meaning that it does not cover every single driving scenario and does not work on all roads in all places. So, for example, if you wanted to move from one place within London or Los Angeles to another, you could use the Level 4 car, select your destination, sit back, relax and wait until the car arrives but you would not be able to select your destination in another city because the car has not yet learned the roads in that other city. You see, although GPS, that's global satellite positioning, is very accurate, it can't fully let the car know every little bit of the road ahead and around it. Um, so that's level four. And level five, this is where it gets uh, a little bit crazy. It seems like the stuff of science fiction, the sort of future you might see in a 1960s film. A level five car wouldn't need a brake or a steering wheel, simply because a human driver isn't necessary. The car wouldn't even look like a conventional car. Um, having said that, some manufacturers are looking at level five as a, a possibility in the next 20 or so years. Let's, for now, just return to level four, which is where most car makers, you know, the regular car makers, Ford, BMW, etc., where they see their own cars becoming a reality. And they see this as a reality 
sometime between 2019 and 2021. Wow, when my kids, who are not even teenagers yet, say they want to drive such and such a car when they're older, they may not even have the chance. It might all be automated by then. Um, until then, there are a few problems um, in that time. I'll try and explain. Um, firstly, next time you're on the road, pay attention to the age of the cars around. Most cars you see on the road are less than 12 years old. Very few cars are more than 20 years old. When automated vehicles are readily available, it certainly doesn't mean that they will be bought immediately by everyone. It will take time, many years, before all vehicles on the road are automated. Let's call that the transition time. Now during that transition time, we will see all those drivers of non-automated vehicles kind of bullying the automated vehicles, cutting into spaces that are not really there, lane and jumping, that sort of thing. They'll be able to do this because the autonomous vehicles are, are more safety aware than humans. Um, the autonomous vehicle will stop to allow non-autonomous cars into spaces. Hence, I think it will take the autonomous vehicle longer to make the same journey as a regular car. And that will be infuriating for the person in the autonomous vehicle. Road rage will be rife, I think, unless there are specific lanes given over on highways and motorways to autonomous vehicles. Secondly, what will happen to those people who drive for a living? Bus drivers, taxi drivers, the growing number of delivery drivers of small vans delivering um, goods bought online and grocery shopping. Will they be rendered useless? Potentially. If the vehicle can drive itself to your home to drop off your Amazon package, who will take the package from the van to the door? Will people want to travel on buses with no driver? These are interesting questions. Now, throughout time, the, the you know the, the longer history, we see these upheavals in the work in the workforce, uh, the massive change from a farming and agriculture economy to working in factories at the time of the industrial revolution. Then the move from working in factories, as automation became more normal, to desk work, the knowledge economy. This change from driving for a living is just a, a similar change, one that people in those jobs will lament, but it will happen. And that will affect, in the UK, well over a million people drive for a living. Thirdly, and this is the big one, um, there will be times when an accident is simply unavoidable. Autonomous vehicles will have to decide which is the lesser of two evils. They can either crash to injure their own occupants or crash and injure someone else, whether that be a pedestrian, cyclist or another car user. In the case of injuring other people, how will the car decide who to crash into? Let's say a mother pushing her baby in a pram or a stroller, or an elderly couple in a car. What we're talking about here is a car requiring a conscience, a morality, which at the moment is, is, I don't think possible, but will be given time. So that explains automated vehicles from their um, level one to level five, uh, where level one is this very basic sort of aids that drivers get at the moment, up to level five, which is where the driver is rendered completely useless. Um, these changes are happening now and they will change the way the roads work in the not too distant future. Exciting times. Thank you.